and um, move to our work session uh, related to transparency and claims for damage to residential premises. Uh, we're going to have two different panels today for this work session, uh, first starting uh, with a perspective from landlords and following up with a perspective from tenants. So if we can have uh, Ryan McKinster and Kevin uh, Weiser, feel free to correct me on the pronunciation of your names, uh, to come forward to kick us off. Um, that would be fantastic, and we'll hear from tenants next. Whoever would like to start, go ahead. Yeah, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, um, and you got my name close enough. It's McKinster. That's better than I ever hear, so I really appreciate that. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Acting Chair uh, Frame and uh, Vice, Vice Chair, oh, actually, Vice Chair Frame and uh, Ranking Member uh, Fortunato um, for this opportunity to speak to you today. Um, for the record, I am Ryan McKinster. I am the Director of Government Affairs for the Washington Multifamily Housing Association. Um, just to set it, give, it, give you an idea of who we are, we are a statewide association representing over 5,000 member companies, over 2,000 apartment communities with over 317,000 units under management. <clears throat> Obviously, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and I appreciate this, uh, this invite. What's working or what's not? That's kind of the framework that I got for this uh, for this work session. Um, for the most part, at least on our side, a lot seems to be working well when we're dealing with security deposits, damage deposits. But I understand there's some concerns by this committee and others in this body and the other body that you're trying to address. So hopefully we can give you some insight from our side of um, this issue to maybe inform your decisions as you move forward. Um, the, one pro the one concern we do have in the current law is a 21-day process. It's very difficult to comply with a 21-day process to offer the paperwork needed to document some of these security deposit um, withholdings. Um, I'm sure most of you are aware we have a labor issue in addition to a housing crisis in this state as well as other states, and part of that is really focused largely, which I'm sure you've heard in the past from others, the construction industry, especially the residential construction industry and multifamily, it's really difficult to get people hired and under contract. And so that 21 day window is pretty difficult. I know there are some conversations in, in, in um, we're not speaking to it right now, but a bill that's before you where they're going to extend that and we appreciate that that consideration because it'll make it easier. Um, will it fix it? It may still be difficult um, and I can give you a quick really a really quick example. Um, with many businesses, I'm sure many of you, you've been in this position, AR and AP processes are usually weeks long or months long. Um, and so traditionally, if you have to get an invoice or you invoice someone, and if you've got multiple players in that process, you can add way more time than 21, 20 days. See, we offer estimates as part of this process, but um, as we move forward, consider what kind of documentation we will need uh, for, for security deposit withholdings. We really want to make sure that it fits in a window that works for us. For example, I spoke with one of our members as a supplier that offers um, carpet services. They're actually a seller of carpets, a wholesaler of carpets to our properties. However, they actually, they're all in one shop. You reach out to them to take care of property replacements on a turn of a unit. However, they don't do most of the work. They actually um, supply the product but they actually outsource the labor. And so if they get a request from a property, it takes two to five days to usually get that request processed, get the, pull, pull the product from their, their warehouse and get it on site. But then right now it's taking over two weeks to get that contractor on site to install it. So you can imagine there, this work needs to happen before invoicing happens. So then they are invoiced from their labor contractor two to four weeks out, and then they have to provide that to the actual property management company. So you can imagine these timelines get pretty extended so um, understanding that process we would as you look forward for what kind of documentation you, you need um, for these withholdings we'd like to have some consideration of how we can get there and make something that's usable but still also protects the tenants because I understand the need for tenants to have their money I recently moved to Seattle about six months ago and obviously I had a damage deposit and stuff like that too and I understand how how concerning it can be especially if you um, have um, maybe a, your lower income and you're moving to a new unit and you have to turn over and, and there's some there's cash flow issues, right? So we definitely understand that and want to be part of the solution. So that's kind of why we're here today and, and appreciate the opportunity to speak to this. Um, also, I would like to say that um, while we're, um, you know, obviously returning this curie deposit to our, our residents in a timely manner and, manner and, you know, the failure to do so can, like I said, can affect them. However, um, we want to make sure whatever process we move forward to as we're considering these changes um, to minimize friction for us as well as our, for our residents. Like I said, this process is longer than we would expect, um, and so we want to make sure that we can 
there's an understanding for the business process side of it, but also there's an understanding that um, residents obviously, like I said, need that security uh, deposit back sooner than later. And uh, one of those concerns that I will highlight now and in, in testimony later is um, what if a tenant moves out, which we have a problem now. A tenant moves out and does not give a forwarding address. Um, there's certain properties that it's more prevalent than others. Uh, they leave, um, they may owe rent, may not, they may have paid it, they just leave the keys on the counter and walk away. We have no way to follow them to get them the proper paperwork. And I know the current law considers that, that action and, and um, some stuff you'll be looking at in the future may consider that as well. But we just wanna be very proactive in having that conversation about what do we deal with in that situation if we can't do that? Is there a hold harmless clause? Is there a time limit that we can recognize to make sure that we are doing our required due diligence to get the security deposit or the statement of withholdings back to that tenant, but as well as understanding if New, through no fault of our own, we are unable to produce that. Um, I think part of that could be a, 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 some type of digital um, um, statement where they could agree to at the beginning of the process, as well as obviously um, a, a hold harmless clause in case we take, you know, we do a first class mail as required and it, you know, it comes back to us or we never hear back in a certain amount of time that they received it. So um, having said that, in the interest of time and efficiency, I know I spoke too much as it is. Um, I like my friend and actually my, uh, one of our members, uh, Kevin Weisher from um, Mercy Housing to uh, speak to specifically the process they go through. I have not uh, gone through this process. I've never turned a unit, um, but I know he has many of them as well as his staff. So he could probably speak to the actual mechanics of what happens when you return a security deposit and turn over a unit. Great, thank you, Kevin. Go ahead and start by introducing yourself. All right, <clears throat> yeah, Kevin Weissar, don't worry, nobody pronounces it correctly. Uh, but yeah, I'm from Mercy Housing, the regional vice president. We have 45 properties throughout Washington state, including uh, Whatcom Skagit, Snohomish, King, Pierce, Thurston, Lewis, and now uh, in Vancouver, Clark County too. We just opened a property with Peace Health. Yeah, that, that is entirely uh, Russian or Ukrainian war uh, refugees. So we just opened that one this year. Uh, but I've been in the affordable management space for 19 years uh, in Washington state. And we nationally are the largest nonprofit affordable housing builder, uh, developer, manager, owner in the US. And we have um, all types of housing, uh, family, senior, permanent supportive housing, and all types of, of uh, funding sources. So HUD, USDA, uh, tax credit, bond, state, local, every, everything. So that's why I'm and then asked to talk on the, the process of a move out and the security deposit. So the first step is always when the notice is given by the tenant to move out. And if it's in person, generally you coordinate a pre-inspection date. Um, if it's not, you do a 48 hour notice to enter and so your maintenance team and your, your property manager go in to assess damages and needs for the turn and then give you know notice for inspection for the move out date. And generally that's not attended, but um, sometimes maybe 25% of the time it is. And so walking through with the resident and talking about <clears throat> uh, the charges and why, and then kind of getting your final list of what you need uh, for the turn. So then you set out turn schedule, those kind of when you can get started depends on other turns you have, emergencies going on, inspections, availability of staff, all those things, vendors, and um, looking at kind of the time frame on some of the, the different elements of it. So cabinets can take uh, four to six weeks for, for your standard cabinets. Um, if there's anything custom, it's about 12 weeks. Carpet takes about a week uh, if, as long as there's available product. Countertops is two weeks, and that depends on when they can come in and measure. And appliances are three to four weeks, uh, depending on where you're at in the state. Doors is three to four weeks, um, to, in, depending on measuring. So those are some of the things that really take the time to get those elements in place. And, and especially with the different programs we have, we can't, or the, you know, like the, the properties and the way they're set up, we don't have enough space to, to keep much of that on hand. Um, and then as far as the deposits, so restricted in Seattle at half of a month's rent, and I think the rest at one month. So for our properties, it's, you know, on average, probably around 500 um, to 1,000 for a security deposit. <clears throat> and I touched base with my area directors, I get six on Monday, and we went through kind of the cost of turns for family properties, because family is kind of the middle ground, so seniors always lower turnover, lower cost, permanent supportive housing, higher turnover, higher cost. But for our family properties, we looked at, and the kind of the average for damages was about four to $8,000 per turn. And then on the higher end, around the $20,000. Uh, 
Uh, the highest was a couple for $75,000. And then there was some that were under 1,000, but um, in a very small fraction under the security deposit. So uh, let's see. And so yeah, in order to make the 21 day deadline, our system requires, we send out that final account statement on the 10th day of the month. Uh, and we, otherwise we can't move our date forward in the system. So an ideal turn is about five days. And um, yeah, it takes a, a general turn is that if it's like pretty easy, maybe 30, 30 days to six weeks if there's a lot going on or you gotta schedule a bunch of vendors. So it's a, it's a long process, but anything else I missed? <laughs> I think you got it. All right, do we have any questions from committee members, either in person or remotely? And I see um, Senator Cooter has her hand up. So let's go Madam Chair first, and then Mr. Ranking Member, do you have one as well? Great, all right. Uh, Madam Chair, if the team could unmute <laughs> Chair Cooter. Thank you, um, and pardon my voice, I'm still recovering. Uh, but my question goes to um, whether or not you have a regular schedule of maintenance and what those items might be. So for example, do you routinely change carpet after X number of years? Do you paint after every uh, move out? Is that something that you would traditionally do irrespective of you know, if there's some handprints on the wall, that kind of thing? So we've tried to change everything from carpet to the vinyl sheet over the last probably 10 years, I would say. So most don't have carpet anymore. And if we did, it's going to the, the, the sheet vinyl. Paint is most, it just depends on, I mean, you, you kind of always have to paint at least the walls, but sometimes ceilings, maybe not, but. And Madam Chair, if I, if I might answer as well, um, I think for most of our members, it's across the gamut. Some do full turns where they, re, they basically repaint all the walls, they patch all the holes, um, they take of everything they'll do. You know, a lot of units now don't have carpet or besides the bedroom. And so a lot of times they don't, has, doesn't get as much traction or traffic wear and tear. So that may not be something they, they change all the time, but um, some of them do that. Some of them do not do it. And I, and I think some of it's based on actually the, you know, the, the monthly, uh, rate of the of the unit higher price units usually go through a full a full turn on it as well and but it's, it's less expected of the tenant on move out as well but that's kind of baked into the upfront price that you pay monthly rather than in the security deposit okay madam vice chair may i have a quick follow-up you may madam chair go ahead thank you i just want to make sure i understand um the answer and thank you for that um, I want to make sure I understand what, what you're saying is that you don't, the, the tenant would not be charged for what you call routine maintenance, right? Um, that would be something that, that uh, the company would, would bear. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, they're just charged for damages. So anything that has to be replaced. And do you have a, a definition of what quote unquote damages would be? Uh, so if it, I mean, there's all kinds of safety standards for HUD that we go by, but yeah, if they, I mean, if there's a chunk taken out of the door or, you know, there's something that's missing, light fixture that's broken, those kind of things. Any follow up, additional follow ups, Madam Chair? I just wanted to know if there was an actual like definition in writing that you follow when you go through each unit, or is it just something that you decide on a case by case basis? So if we have to buy something, then that's what's charged, yeah. And Kevin, I feel like I also heard you mention some HUD regulations, so I wonder if we don't already have our hands on what regulations from HUD that you have to follow, that would be helpful, because it sounds like there might be some definitions there as well. Yeah, there, well, especially like USDA has everything spelled out in terms of what they have as estimated costs, those kind of things, but really it's, I mean, when you're doing your budgets and all that stuff, if you have one supplier, so HD supply for you know your parts or, um, Whirlpool for your appliances or Sherwin-Williams for your flooring, whatever, you kind of have an idea of what you're getting all that stuff bidded every year and it's not changing a ton. So yeah, you're generally charging for what that, you know, that budgeted amount, what's in their catalog um, or what you've agreed to on your national contract each year for different parts. So that's, it's known, but it's, you're not going to get an invoice for, you know, six weeks at least. And I should say apologies to the audience. Um, I try not to use acronym, acronym soup. So HUD is the uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. I also feel like I've, I heard you, did you say USDA? Yeah, so we have rural housing too. We have nine of those. So the- The U.S. Department of Agriculture. Interesting. Okay. Yep, yep. Just met with them in D.C. last week. The, but they have all new inspection this year. So that, it all has that stuff listed out. Great. Acronym soup. Did mm -hmm. you define the process? All right. 
Um, Mr. Ranking Member, go ahead with your question. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And to dovetail with uh, you know what uh, Senator Cooter was talking about, <clears throat> I go in, I rent this, I rent a unit, and I, a year later, I, uh, you know, my lease is up and I move out. Uh, and there's a hole in the wall. There's, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, some damage to the floor, a little piece of, of the floor is damaged. Um, uh, do you have a standard list of costs for some of these items so that when I, if I come and I rent your unit and you say, okay, you know, here's your lease, here's your this, here's your that. When you check out, we are going to be looking at this, 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 and this. Yep. If you it's have a damaged uh, hole in the wall, $25, you know, a damaged this, and you know, 25 floor damage, 50 to $80. Yep. You know, those kinds of things so that when I go to check out, <clears throat> you come in, we walk through the apartment and we agree, for example, okay, yeah, I do got a hole in the wall. It's a small one, 25 bucks. It's a big one, 50 bucks. Is there a, a standard list like that, that we would be able to, uh, as a renter, be able to look at and say, this guy's, you know, oh, this guy's giving me the shaft here because it really wasn't this, it was that. Yeah. And, so, and but look on a list of, of standard costs so I know what that range is. Yeah, so ideally you go through that at the move-in with the lease and you give that to them and then that's what the pre-move inspection is for, is to hope to take a little bit off of our plate by saying, these are the things you'll potentially be charged for if they're not taken care of at move out and kind of a prep. And then the, the maintenance person can also try and order ahead so that they can get stuff to arrive in terms of the parts before they actually have to turn the unit. And then the final move out is, okay, here's what is still outstanding in terms of the issues. So yeah, we have that list. Yep, with costs, yep. correct? Yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. And I guess I'll ask one follow-up there is where, if you have definitions of what crosses over from normal wear and tear to something that actually costs. And I'm thinking about things like carpet in particular, and I hear you that you're trying to remove carpet from <laughs> units. So, I mean, maybe a better example is like what Mr. Ranking Member said that the vinyl flooring, like wh where does it move from, you know, what normal wear and tear is, vinyl flooring may peel up, and that's just something that you repair versus you know, there's, it's been cut up with a knife and that's obviously chargeable or something like that. Do you have definitions about like, here's an example of what's normal wear and tear. Here's an example of what we, we would charge you for. So that, in that case would be more whatever the vendor is going to charge us. So when they come in, they're going to come in with us that first week at least and say, this is what it's going to cost you. Cause if they, you know, you have a national relationship, you have a regional relationship with those vendors and then individually the tech that comes out, will have a relationship with the manager and say, all right, this one's going to cost you 300 bucks or whatever. So yeah, you have that. I mean, it's an estimate essentially, but it's what they're going to charge us. And so, yeah, it gets passed along. So let me clarify my question. <clears throat> this may be a bad example, but, and I'm thinking even of like, um, old Formica, um, <laughs> in my house, cause my house is very old, you know, like sometimes adhesive just wears down. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if something like an adhesive on the floor started to come up or adhesive on your countertop starts to come off, like, is that just normal wear and tear? Like, that's what I mean is like, do you have definitions of if this happens, we're going to repair it because that's just what happens after something's been used for so long versus here's an example of what we see as damage that you cause that's not normal wear and tear and we're going to charge you for it. And that's where your example of the itemized costs come in. Yeah, I mean, we kind of have the two ends of the spectrum, though, because we have folks that have been living in our housing for 30 years that obviously if there was a turn, you know, it's it's it's, it's past its usable life. But we also have quick turnover units where it's clearly damaged because it was three months, you know, et cetera. So it's tough in terms of there may be more examples on the market side, but yeah, we, we generally have it's real obvious damage or they've been there forever. And so there's no charges. I think that might be a little bit of the heart of what we're getting to today is <laughs> clarity and transparency. Ground. So, okay, great. Any other questions from committee members, either remotely or in person? All right. Well, thank you both for your time. Really appreciate it. And let's uh, move on to our next panel. Uh, so let's have come forward offering our tenant perspective. Um, Sarah Nagy, again, if I screwed that up on the pronunciation, sorry, and Scott Crane, you could come up and uh, whoever wants to go first, please introduce yourself and your organization. Thank you. Uh, you actually got my name exactly right. Thank you. I'm like zero or <laughs> three for three today. All right, That's let's right. go. Thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Nagy. I'm a staff attorney with Columbia Legal Services. We're a civil legal aid organization. We do work on behalf of low-income communities across Washington. Um, and I'm here to speak to you about preventing unfair residential damage claims. Um, what we're seeing is that lack of transparency in these damage claims is leading to housing instability. Inflated or falsified charges uh, against a tenant's security deposit can keep them out of new housing, it can damage their credit, and it can drain their finances in that precarious time between tenancies when they really need them most. Um, next slide, please. I don't know if I have a... Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just going to go really quickly but through what's in the actual law right now. So, you know, we, we know what we're talking about when we're seeking changes and improvements. Um, so deposits and fees are treated separately in the RLTA. They have to be disclosed as such in the lease agreement. A deposit is obviously refundable. It has to be kept separate from the landlord's money. The tenant always has to know where that money is being kept. And the tenant's right to that money comes ahead of all creditors to the landlord in case of foreclosure or something similar. Um, in order to deduct from a deposit, uh, the rental agreement has to be in writing. It has to include the conditions under which the deposit can be withheld. Uh, at the beginning of the tenancy, the landlord has to provide a written checklist to the tenant describing the condition of the premises at move-in. And at the end, the landlord has to provide a full and specific statement of the basis for keeping the deposit within 21 days. And as the folks on the other panel mentioned, uh, there is in legislation a suggestion to increase that to 30. I'll also add that in current law, uh, the landlord is exempt from liability for delay if things go as far as a dispute in court, they can show that the delay was because of circumstances beyond their control. So that protection currently exists for the landlord. Um, the RLTA makes clear that for the duration of a tenancy, the deposit is the tenant's money and the landlord is its custodian and has to justify their use of it. It's not landlord profit, it's there to reimburse expenses for damage more than ordinary wear and tear. And the landlord has certain transparency obligations, but we're seeing more and more that these are not sufficient to protect tenants as the law is intended to do. Um, a few of those weaknesses, uh, landlords, as we said, can't uh, deduct from the deposit for damages that constitute ordinary wear and tear, but that's not defined in statute currently. So, a lot of times renters can be expected to be charged regardless of how carefully they prepare for move out. There's just no consistency in what one landlord sees as ordinary wear and what another landlord does. It's a crapshoot every time. And however well someone prepares for move out, they can still be surprised by these damages that they had no reason to think would count against them. Um, the full and specific basis for withholding the deposit doesn't require documentation of actual costs. So it's very easy for bad actors to exaggerate the cost of supplies or labor. They can simply put down a price on a piece of paper and present it to the tenant as an invoice with nothing behind it. And that's the number there is, regardless of whether that's the actual cost the landlord incurred or not. This. Um, the landlord also retains the right to send the tenant to collections or report the debt to tenant screening companies or a future landlord, even when those charges aren't substantiated. And that keeps tenants out of future tenancies. The fact of that debt is reason enough to deny someone's housing application, regardless of whether they're working on disputing it, regardless of the circumstances of it, regardless if there's any proof at all that these damages ever really existed, that can still keep someone out of housing. And finally, currently tenants can be sued for debt for damage claims up to six years after the end of the tenancy, long, 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 long after anyone probably remembers what happened, or and long after there's been enough time in the unit that there's no way to prove anything anymore. This leads to exaggerated and unfair charges. It's very common. Um, it's very common to see landlords charging every tenant in a building for standard cleaning or unit turnover, regardless of the condition of the unit. Everybody gets that same little deduction. It's basically treating a portion of the deposit as a fee. Um, We've seen charges of hundreds or thousands or sometimes tens of thousands of dollars in excess of the deposit for repairs. 
Um, it's perfectly possible for a landlord to basically put the cost of a remodel on a tenant and to tell them, we can argue about this or you can go to collections, your choice. Uh, renters, they get surprised by these massive charges. Maybe they really worked hard to clean the place up. They you know, rented the carpet cleaner. They felt like they knew what they could expect, what they would be charged for. Yeah, okay, my kid scribbled on that wall. I'm sure I'll see something for that, but I did my best to clean up everything else, to clean the holes in the wall and so on. And then they get surprised by these absolutely massive charges or these collections notices. And this is between tenancies when they're trying to pay move-in costs, like another security deposit, first and last month's rent sometimes, and whatever other fees are coming in on top of that. And lacking documentation of actual costs, the more time passes, it becomes impossible to contest. Um, and as I mentioned before, debt to a previous landlord is reason enough to deny someone housing. Um, increased transparency leads to more stable housing. Uh, if we have a clear of ordinary wear, there's greater consistency, move out costs are more predictable for both landlords and tenants. Uh, requiring transparency and better documentation than the law currently requires uh, would protect renters from exaggerated and falsified costs. It would help resolve disputes without going to small claims court. And it would help renters discharge bad debt. It's too easy in current law for landlords to charge tenants for costs they aren't responsible for, driving up their housing costs and putting them in a less stable place for future tenancies. Um, and those are ways in which we can hopefully improve those weaknesses in the law. Thanks for your time. Happy to answer any questions. We'll go ahead and have our second speaker and then we'll see if we have questions. Go ahead. Thank you, Acting Chair, uh, Ranking Member Fortunato, members of the committee. My name is Scott Crane. I'm an attorney with Northwest Justice Project, which is our state's largest provider of free civil legal services uh, for low-income people, funded by the people of the state of Washington and the Legal Services Corporation. Thank you for inviting us to testify about uh, transparency and rental fees. Um, today, I just want to uh, bring the committee's attention to the materials that uh, we provided in advance of the hearing um, and how they may be helpful for the committee's deliberation of this issue. Uh, the first is data that we provided uh, to the House in its consideration of House Bill 1074 regarding uh, damage deposit and dispute issues. Um, just what is the scope of this problem as we experience it? Um, after eviction, it's the number one issue that renters call us about. Um, we hear from a lot of people about evictions, uh, but second only to that is people who have disputes about not getting their deposit back or disputes about unfair charges that they want to contest. Um, the second document I'd like to bring your attention to is a report from the National Consumer Law Center that was provided on uh, complaints to the federal government by consumers across the country uh, for problems that they've been experiencing with rental debt. And what the document shows uh, is the problems we experience here are problems experienced around the country. This is truly a national problem uh, in terms of its scope and its impact on renters' ability to find safe and stable housing and to contest charges that they disagree with. Um, and so, again, the, the issue is not only important here in Washington, it's a, it's a problem throughout the country. Um, Ten years ago, if you asked me what was a problem facing a renter trying to get into new housing, I would say, well, if they had an eviction record, that would be a huge problem for them. That would be a red flag and they wouldn't be able to rent, um, regardless of whether the eviction was misleading or inaccurate or they won in that eviction. Um, and the legislature responded to that problem when it uh, passed the order of limited dissemination, giving tenants a way to clear up things that were misrepresentations in their rental history record. We haven't kept up with uh, rental debt. Rental debt can be misleading. It can track consumers around for years and they have little ability to address that issue in a way that is not extremely cost intensive, that requires litigation or lawyers to get involved. And so the laws as they stand really do not allow a renter to do this. And as a result, we see, as Sarah mentioned, this is now the new red flag. If you have rental debt to a prior landlord, accurate or not, you're probably gonna be denied um, where you rent next. The third document I'd like to draw the committee's attention to is just some examples from consumers we've spoken to uh, when they have rental debt and how that appears to them. 
There's just a couple of pages there, and I, I'm going to briefly address what those, I think, say. Uh, the first one is a, it's a bill to a renter who moved out, and it's stamped preliminary. So this is the landlord's anticipation of what they believe they will charge this renter and why they are taking their deposit. It may not be based in reality. Uh, oftentimes, as a lawyer, when I see round numbers for estimates for damages, I get a little suspicious because I think that's an estimate. That doesn't exactly represent the true cost of, of the damages to be repaired. Um, so that's one problem we deal with often is inaccurate estimates that are later uh, either inflated or reduced, but maybe much later. And so the consumer doesn't have access to the deposit um, and they have that reported on their credit. The second document is two pages and, and the first page is a collection dunning letter to a consumer. And this is the first this consumer heard that they weren't getting their deposit back was when a collection agency uh, demanded $151 from them. Uh, this consumer thought they were going to get their $250 deposit back, and instead they got a bill. Um, and that bill, as you can see, is the second page there, which is four handwritten lines uh, for cleaning charges, carpet charges, drip pans on a stove, um, and damage to a door. And, and what this one really shows is that oftentimes when renters are faced with damages, uh, these are just hidden non-refundable fees that are not disclosed to the renter at the start of the tenancy standard cleaning. Everybody gets that charge, even if they left the place clean. That's a non-refundable fee, and it wasn't disclosed pursuant to law at the commencement of the tenancy. It's charged at the back end and taken out of the deposit. Same with the standard carpet cleaning. Carpet might have been clean, and in this case it was, but that standard charge is applied to every renter at the back end and taken out of the deposit. So we will see fees that aren't properly disclosed and um, no schedule of charges, for example. I know that was a question from the committee. It's pretty rare that you have a rental agreement that lists the charges. There are some out there um, that say, you know, repainting will cost this much, annual carpet, you know, replacement this much for depending on the life of the carpet left. But that's pretty rare and I think also hard to estimate in advance what those charges will be if the tenancy lasts 10 years. That might not be an accurate representation of those damages at the end of the tenancy. Um, so I, I would bring the committee's attention to these materials uh, just to understand what these look like to consumers and ultimately the, just the limited options that they have to deal with it. If they dispute this, the remedy is to call the landlord. They can call the collection agency and all they're going to get is, again, those four lines. And then at the end of the day, they've got a choice. Do they want to sue their landlord and take the risks or do they want to let this sit on their credit for the next seven years and affect their housing? So. Uh, the problem is it's increasing. It's, it's considerably the worst problem that renters face trying to rent new housing if they have this problem, um, and they have very limited tools to deal with it at the present time. Thank you for your time, and happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much. Are there any questions from members of the committee, either online or in person? Give it a minute. All right. Seeing none, thank you both thank very you. much for your time today and for all the materials that you provided to us. Um, probably should have noted earlier for members of the public and for committee members, um, the electronic bill book has the slides that you saw today, and I believe some other handouts are referenced, so that's available. Okay, well, that, thank you. We are done with our work session. I think we are ready to move on to our bill hearing. Um, so let's go ahead and open up the hearing for uh, Substitute House Bill 1074, starting with a uh, briefing. Go ahead, Riley. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, uh, members of the committee for the record again, Riley Benj, staff to the committee. <clears throat> Before you is House Bill 1074 concerning documentation and processes governing claims by landlords for damage to residential premises. This bill comes to you with a vote of 5740 from the House floor. For brief background, the Residential Landlord Tenant Act or RLTA regulates the relationship between landlords and tenants of residential dwelling units. The RLTA establishes rights and duties of both tenants and landlords, procedures for the parties to enforce their rights, and remedies for violations of the RLTA. Tenants generally have a duty to restore the rental premises to its initial condition except for normal wear and tear, and landlords often collect a deposit to cover any damage caused by the tenant beyond normal wear and tear. In order for a landlord to collect a deposit, a rental agreement must be in writing and a written checklist describing the condition, cleanliness, and existing damages to the premises must be provided to the tenant. At the end of the tenancy, a landlord has 21 days to provide a full and specific statement of the basis for retaining any deposit and pay any refund due to the tenant. The bill before you requires a landlord to substantiate the cost of any damages withheld from a tenant's deposit with copies of estimates received and invoices paid. 
The bill prohibits landlord, a landlord from retaining any portion of a deposit for certain items, including wear resulting from ordinary use of the premises. Wear resulting from ordinary use is defined as deterioration that results from the intended use of a dwelling unit, including breakage or malfunction due to age or deteriorated condition, but does not include deterioration that results from negligence, carelessness, accident, or abuse of the premises, fixtures, equipment, appliances, or furnishings by the tenant. The time period in which a landlord must provide a statement and documentation as the basis for retaining any portion of a tenant's deposit and pay any refund is increased from 21 to 30 days. And the bill further provides that damages resulting from ordinary wear and tear are not, or not substantiated with documentation may not be charged to the tenant, reported to any consumer reporting agency, tenant screening service, or prospective landlord, or submitted for collection by any third party agency. Finally, any action to recover sums exceeding the amount of the damage deposit must be commenced within three years from the end of the tenancy. A fiscal note was not requested, and with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Great questions for staff. I see Senator Gildon's got his hand up. Go ahead, Senator. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Part of this bill says that um, if the landlord fails to give the statement together with uh, any refund due to the tenant within the time limit specified, that they'll be liable to the tenant for the full amount of the deposit. Am I reading that correctly? Is it the full deposit or if they didn't include, you know, one item that it would only be that one item? Um, I would have to get into the bill specifically. Do you know the, the page and, and line to which you're referring? I, I apologize. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I could find it quickly. I'm sure I don't have it right here at my hand. I just have my notes on the bill. Um, so, yeah, just one second. I think here in existing law, it says that um, if the landlord collects a deposit without providing a written checklist at the commencement of the tenancy, the landlord is liable to the tenant for the amount of the deposit and the prevailing party may recover court costs and reasonable attorney's fees. So I believe that, yes, you are reading that correctly. And did I just hear you saying, Riley, that that is underlying law that you're referring to, or that's part of the bill? That was current law. Got it. That's current law. Okay. Um, thank you. Any other questions for staff? All right, seeing none, I see our prime sponsor, Representative Milan Tai, has joined us. Representative Tai, would you like to join us at the front and tell us about your bill? Thank you. I didn't know that running from JLAP over here exert that much energy. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, first of all, for the record, my name is Mi Lin Tai. I have the um, honor to represent the 41st Legislative District. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Ranking Member, and members of the committee for um, having a hearing on this legislation. Um, Oh boy, I don't even know where to begin. Um, I will begin with um, with uh, my why um, to 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 sponsor this legislation. Um, first of all, I um, I have uh, two children who are attending college. Um, one of them uh, are renter and the other staying in the dorm. So um, I get to see the differences of how they are being uh, treated as renter uh, versus not. Um, as a parent, uh, I naturally am very protective of, of them and um, understanding some of the struggles that they have to get through as college kids uh, because they remind me of myself and I hope that many of you have experienced that as college uh, students um, really uh, finding money for food, uh, pay tuitions, and uh, pay for rent. Um, when my son need to move from one uh, apartment building into um, a house that he share with his uh, classmate, um, the uh, safe deposit were, ended up be one of the challenge um, that he couldn't understand why. 
Uh, so that was my, that is my personal story. And a second personal story is uh, because I am a landlord myself. Um, my, uh, as you are going to see some of the housing legislation, that the house was crazy enough to stay up late in the night into the morning uh, to pass out the house to send it to you. Uh, they are in three buckets. One is around supply for housing to deal with our current housing crisis. The other is stabilization, and last is support. I see this legislation sitting in stable, stabilization to make sure that those who are currently housed continue to be housed. So it's about moving from one place to another. We are dealing with a first, first month rent, second month rent, um, a safe deposit, and, uh, and you know, there's other fees, pet fees, cupboard cleaning fees. Um, as a landlord, um, I rent out a mother-in-law unit um, in my house to uh, local college students. Um, many of you who have visited my home, it's very close in proximity to Bellevue College. And I understand how difficult it is uh, for people who find affordable housing, especially in Bellevue. And so I would be the first who recognize it. And as a landlord, I use my power to determine, number one, the amount of rent, and number two, what I would consider um, wear and tear. And, um, and that is how I uh, came to understand the current definition of wear and tear uh, sitting in our statute, in our state. And I believe that the update of that definition is much needed. So I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this legislation to you for your consideration, and I'm hoping that you would consider support it and pass it, um, not only our committee, but all the way to the governor's desk, simply because we need it. We need that sta stabilization um, in our housing, um, making sure people are housed. Um, I, as a landlord, I came from a place of not only wearing a hat of a, a landlord, I'm wearing a hat of a mother, I'm wearing a hat of a sister, I'm wearing a hat of a good neighbor, and I'm so wearing a hat of a state legislator. You and I have the power to change that policy so that not only our children who are experiencing this difficulty of finding place to live, but it also our neighbor having difficulty finding place to live, and this is how I see it. This is part of our responsibility of building our communities. We cannot simply say that we want the best teachers to teach in our schools when our best teacher could even find affordable housing. Uh, when we talked about one of the best uh, police officers who provide public safety for our community, when some of our police officers who joined the force couldn't find affordable housing. So these are our responsibilities, and I'm asking for your support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Tai. Do we have any questions, any questions for our prime sponsor? Seeing none. Thank you, Representative Tai. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right. So before we um, hear public testimony, just a little orientation for folks who might be new to this. Um, we have 21 people signed up to testify today. We are going to use a timer. We'll start with two minutes and make sure that we can um, get through that. Um, for remote testifiers, folks that are on Zoom, when it's your time to kind of get pulled into the room, uh, you'll have a little pop-up that comes up on your screen asking you to join the meeting as a panelist. Um, please accept that prompt and then turn on your video, uh, but keep your mute on. And then once you are actually recognized and your name is called, unmute yourself and then begin speaking. Um, in order for you to see that timer, you need to have your own Zoom in gallery mode. Uh, folks are, who are in person, uh, we'll try to give you a heads up that you're on deck so you can be ready. If you say, if I tell you you're on deck, please come to the front row so we don't wait a minute for you. Some of you are very far back, um, so we want to give you a chance to come up to the front. Um, and that two-minute timer for those of you in person will be right here. I think at two minutes it turns at 30 seconds to yellow, and then at red you are done, and I will politely cut you off. All right. So with that, let's move to our public testimony. I think we're starting with a remote panel. Uh, let's uh, pull into the room Terry Anderson, Tal 
uh, Tulana Reed and Dominique Korn. And on deck also in Zoom, so they can get ready, Gage Shepard, Duke Jackson, and Linda uh, Duclo. So let's start with Terry Anderson. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Terry Anderson and I direct the Spokane Office of the Tenants Union of Washington State and I'm speaking in support of House Bill 1074. We talk to tenants in Spokane and Eastern Washington every day through clinics, hotline tenant workshops and meetings. One of the most common reasons tenant contact us is because they expected the return of their damage deposit and either received nothing or instead of a check they received an invoice charging them hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars and these invoices do not make sense to them. Tenants do not know if they're being charged for normal wear and tear because the charges are vague and confusing. This is sadly not uncommon for tenants whose first language is not English and who may not comprehend or understand the charges and are desperate when they rely on the return of their deposit and get nothing returned to them. The timing in these situations could not be worse. They are forced to borrow money from friends and family or even worse, turn to payday loans to make up for the losses of the return of their own money and fall further into debt. I conduct tenant workshops for immigrant and refugee communities and the most common questions are about why the damage deposit was not returned. Case managers and community leaders regularly refer tenants to our office because of the loss of damage deposits and unspecified and unsubstantiated costs for damage. Several weeks ago, I received an invoice from the leader of the Marshallese community for $2,778.71 for arbitrary unspecified repairs that were charged to a member of their community. This invoice only lists the items such as door, exterior door, refrigerator, etc., with an arbitrary charge next to it. There are no receipts, pay stubs, timesheets for the actual cost. The math was even miscalculated, so the numbers don't even add up. The only recourse for these vulnerable tenants is to file a claim in small claims court where only English is spoken and tenants are forced to act as their own attorney. Tenants are denied housing when they owe debt to a private landlord, whether or not the tenant even knows about the debt. Please make it easier for tenants to get the return of their money and easier to understand when landlords deduct cleaning charges. Please pass House Bill 1074. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry. And before we go on to our next testifier, I've been informed that none of the three people I told to be on deck are actually in Zoom at this point. So let's make let's have on deck Scott Crane, Casey Burton, and Corey Brewer. And if any of the folks do show up in Zoom, we'll go to them after all, but just wanna make sure folks are ready. All right, Talana, Reed, go ahead. Thank you for working to my name, thank you for working to improve our affordable housing prices. My name is Talana Reed, and I'm with the Tenants Union of Washington, and I'm Pro House Bill 1074. Tenants will finally have some long-awaited insurance when they pay the when they pay landlords money as a deposit. In most instances, thousands of dollars, hundreds of dollars. As, re as recipients of large sums of money to be held as deposits, landlords should be required to, pro to provide tenants with insurance that they will adhere to the agreement that it will be returned if there's no damage to the unit. This bill is that insurance. It makes landlords accountable to tenants for the return of that tenant's money. This makes the transaction equitable rather than giving one party power to take advantage of the other which is what has been happening to thousands of tenants over the years because landlords don't have to account for inflated or bogus charges being taken out of damage deposits. I'm a 48-year-old renter and have paid many security deposits over the years. I currently rent an apartment in, in Olympia, and I've had to pay over $4,900 to move into my unit. $250 was for my 12-year-old cat as a non-refundable pet damage deposit. $1,500 was for a damage deposit and the rest for first and last month's rent. I've lived in many units, and none of which have had brand new carpet. Statements I've received say things like, replace light bulb, $150. Carpet cleaning, upwards to $500. Drip pans, $250. Clean window seals, $300, and so on. I've fallen victim to predatory landlords because they do not have to account for or show proof of charges when taking out of my damage deposit. I see and hear stories like mine every single day as an advocate and as a case manager. And I urge you to pass this bill so that tenants can be protected and we can ensure that folks are able to not have additional damage to their, their credit because of predatory landlords. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Dominique Korn, go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, thank you for giving me time today. My name is Dominique Korn. 
I'm a mom, a CHW, a social worker, and a renter in the 17th district. We need accountability and transfer, transparency with our landlords. As a tenant, I have multiple experiences that documentation was needed for me to maintain my rights as a tenant. I've had landlords choose to keep my deposits and try to charge me for things that were clearly not my responsibility. I've had a landlord tear out his own fencing, put it in a pile, and take a picture of it and charge me to dump his fencing after I moved out. He included photos in this instant, which was wonderful because without those photos, I would not have been able to contest the fee that just said dump fee and didn't clarify that it was really from him deciding to remodel his house and take out the fencing. Renters deserve to see documentation of how their deposits have been utilized. My second point is any work I've ever done has required me to show documentation for my expenses. Whether it was a $5 lift or a $500 plane ticket, a $30 meal or a $2 soda, I've had to provide receipts to substantiate what my charges were to get my reimbursement. I don't claim that tenants don't ever cause damages. I only claim that the damages that exist are easy to document and the only damages that are difficult to document are the damages that don't exist. Please vote yes on House Bill 1074. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dominique. Um, my understanding is we are still missing Gage Shepard, Duke Jackson, and Linda Ducolo. So we'll go ahead and go to Scott Crane, Casey Burton, and Corey Brewer. Um, yeah, I don't see Scott Crane yet. So Casey Burton, if you want right to go. Here. Oh, you are. You're in person. Okay. Well, if I'd actually looked at my notes there, Scott, and remembered your name, we'd be in good shape. Go ahead. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, acting Chair, Ranking Member, uh, members of the committee, my name is Scott Crane. I am an attorney at Northwest Justice Project, which is our state's largest provider of civil legal services for low-income people, funded by the people of the state of Washington and the Legal Services Corporation. Uh, thank you for the invitation to testify about this bill. Um, the number one call we get after evictions from renters is calls about disputes about damage deposits. Renters who don't get their deposit back, renters who contest charges that show up in their credit report, and renters who've been denied housing as a result of these debts. Uh, this is a problem in the state of Washington, is a problem throughout the country, and it's currently uh, one of the hardest problems to fix for a renter trying to find housing. Uh, this bill will have a positive impact on the ability of renters to reduce that information asymmetry, to understand why they are being charged, and to contest it if necessary. Um, and it's, it's a positive step in that direction to get the law up to speed with the modern tenant screening industry. Um, and briefly, Senator Gildon, I, I would try to answer your question as well to staff earlier. Uh, the current state of the law is if the landlord does not provide the deposit statement, they're liable to the full amount of the deposit back to the tenant. The new law would also require the full amount of the deposit back to the tenant if either the statement or any documentation was missing. So I think your read of that was correct. What I would say is though it's a little more modest than that sounds because it does not extinguish the debt. The landlord could still always sue the tenant or send to credit, uh, send to their credit the amount that they believe the tenant owes. It merely uh, adjudicates the deposit that it goes back to the tenant. The landlord could still attempt to collect damages that they believe are owed whether or not they gave that money back to the tenant. So I hope that answers your question and thank you for your time. Great, Scott, thank you so much. Before we hear from Casey and Corey, let me uh, let Ryan McK McKinster know he's on deck in person and then get Gordon Haggerty and Bruce Becker also ready on deck on Zoom. All right, Casey Burton, you're up, go ahead. Casey, you are still on mute. Let's go ahead and get you off mute and then we'll restart the timer. Can you hear me? We sure can. Go ahead. Well, that's always good. <laughs> Hi, I'm Casey Burton. I'm a senior staff attorney at the Senate Policy Center in Seattle. Casey, um, I'm going to stop yeah. you. Your um, audio is not great. So you might, if that microphone. Can you hear me? Yep. The, go well, ahead. Hold first. the microphone up to your <laughs> mouth. Yes, that's fine. You got it. Let's go ahead and start over again and All hold right. that mic Third up to your mouth. Term. Yep. Thanks. All right. You got it. Okay. Well, Thank you for having me today. My name is Casey Burton. I'm a senior staff attorney at the Tenant Law Center in Seattle. Uh, we regularly work with people who are stuck with charges from their landlords and they have no idea where they've come from. They don't know how to fight it. And they're stuck in a pretty tricky situation because sometimes deposits are a lot of money 
And it's not even a matter of just losing your money. That's stuck on your credit report if your landlord not only holds on to your deposit, but they say that you owe even more. And we deal with folks all the time who come to us who say, I left this place perfect. I don't understand what the problem is. And, you know, landlords can charge, sometimes, unfortunately, bad actors charge for a lot of ridiculous things. Um, for cleaning carpets that had stains when the tenant already moved in. And as a previous testifier mentioned, for essentially remodeling the unit. Um, this law provides clarity for landlords on what isn't isn't okay, but it also provides guidance on documentation. As it stands right now, there is no standard of proof that a landlord has to meet before sending a debt over to collections. You can reach out to the collection agency and say, I didn't cause this damage, but at the end of the day, the collection agency can essentially just say, well, we'll list that it's contested, and they won't remove it a lot of the time. Landlords are obligated by law to provide an itemized list of what they're charging you for. They can't deduct based on guesses. And this law simply says, okay, attach the receipts. So I ask that you support this bill and pass it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, um, Casey. And just a reminder to members both on Zoom and in person, if you have a question, just let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to keep cruising through testimony. All right, Corey Brewer, you are up. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you, Corey Brewer. I'm a property manager, and I personally oversee, sign off on uh, hundreds of security deposit refunds every year, um, mostly for single-family houses. Um, I signed in as other on this bill. Um, there are elements of it that I do support. Um, there are still some details uh, contained within uh, that I cannot support. Um, I've got a lot more than two minutes worth of things to say about this, and if there are any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Um, what I really want to illustrate uh, is that there is a huge difference between single-family houses that are rentals and these large apartment communities. Um, every house is unique, and virtually all repairs and cleaning jobs that we hire out post-tenancy are custom jobs. Um, there's no on-site maintenance staff or a storage room where, you know, it's full of supplies that would work for every unit throughout the community. Um, uh, the example that I'd love to get a deep dive into is what it takes to replace a broken window. Uh, if if anyone would like me to tell that kind of a story. Anyway, um, utilities are built on 60-day cycles. Um, the, the idea that uh, we would need to provide receipts for all the money that is spent, I agree with that. It's not necessarily going to be achievable to gather all of that within 21 days or within 30 days, um, supply chain labor. Uh, we heard from um, the initial panel uh, kind of really going through that process, what it takes to hire out someone to perform this work and to obtain the materials. And finally, we will get an invoice for that. But um, we can't snap our fingers and and make an, uh, an estimate with detailed numbers appear on short notice. Corey, thank you so much for your testimony today. And um, for folks who have testimony in excess of two minutes, you did great today. We always encourage um, written uh, testimony is great. If you have specific amendatory language or specific suggestions, um, please send those to the committee and we're happy to share out. Thank you so much for your time today. All right, uh, before we have Ryan, go ahead and come forward. Uh, before we have this next panel, let me just share who is on deck. Michelle Thomas here in the room. Nick Federici and Hunter Herrera McFarland, if they could just be ready to go, that'd be great. But why don't we start now with Ryan? Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Ranking Member Fortunato, and members of the committee. I, I, will, I will forego a description of who I am or what the, where I'm with. I will just say I'm Ryan McKenzie, Director of Government Affairs for Washington Multifamily Housing Association. I think you know who we are. Um, I will first of all I want to begin by thanking Columbia Legal Services for their willing to meet with our industry and have discussions. We've had productive discussions around this bill and some other issues that we've been before you this legislature. And we truly appreciate the ability to have those conversations uh, outside of this room to see if we can find compromise on some of these things we're, we're discussing today. Um, I, we do, however, we still have a few issues we're hoping we can be resolved before this uh, makes it through the process. Um, number one is the issues around cleaning and um, carpet cleaning deposits. Um, there is a need and it's a, it's a requirement. It's kind of been, it's pretty standard um, nationwide that that's something you pay for. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, 
there's a difference between a, da a fully damaged carpet you have to replace, but a carpet that needs to be cleaned. Um, someone, myself, that has allergies, um, you know, I'm moving to a place, I'm expecting to be free of dirt. I mean, it's not just dander for animals, just general dust and stuff like that does. I clean my uh, carpet religiously because it's, it's in my best interest of my health. You could have people that live in a unit for a year and they do not clean the carpet. So the new person moving in is expecting, you know, a clean, safe, uh, carpet uh, when they move in. However, if we go into that unit, there's no way to know if it's clean or not. And it's one of the reasons we have, you know, clean carpet clean deposit is to take care of that thing. We assume our, our, our residents, which most of them do, keep regular maintenance, including cleaning carpets, you know, vacuuming regularly and things along those lines, but sometimes they don't. And that's one of the reasons we, we, we ask for that charge. Um, we also believe that documentation, which is referred to multiple times in this and current statute, uh, be defined at some, at some uh, capacity and that definition to include what estimates would be and if that, if that they're allowed. Um, there is some concern with the court decision in Silver versus Rooting Management Company that estimates may not protect protect us for our requirement to provide a statement at the end of this process when we're taking a security deposit. So we would really ask that somewhere in this bill, um, documentation, including estimates, is defined. Great. Ryan, thank you so much. We do have a question. Senator Shoemake, go ahead. Thank you. And this might be a philosophical question, but um, shouldn't that, if a carpet cleaning is going to be done every time, no matter the state, shouldn't that be just a cost of doing business? Or what is the cost of doing business versus the deposit, which I think is to ensure against, you know, I'm living outside of my home. If I throw wild parties and create a big mess, that's what the deposit I thought was supposed to cover. Actual damage, not just things that you do every time someone moves out, but tell me your philosophy on that. Yeah, well, well Sandra, I think there's there's value in that conversation. Um, one concern, one discussion that's been had is, or do we have an, a non-refundable, you know, cleaning fee up front? Obviously, there is some value in that conversation. I will point out um, uh, property management companies or owners such as um, Mercy Housing, who you heard from earlier today, they're not allowed by law to charge those. So they have no way to recoup that cost and they cannot put it into their rent. So they have no way to add that in their operating cost. Um, if we're looking at the market side, yeah, that's true. It could be an operating cost, which will be higher, um, higher rents overall because it's an operating cost and it does do pass through to the tenant. So yes, to your point, there is, I think there's a valuable conversation around that. How However, ultimately, it will be borne by the tenants. I guess it's how we want to discuss to get at that with recognizing some people can and cannot charge for that. Thank you so much. Any follow-up, Senator Schumick, before I go to Madam Chair? I guess just philosophically, I mean, it, one of the big problems is that it feels like a crapshoot whether or not you get your deposit back. Um, and that doesn't feel fair. It doesn't really create incentives to take good care of your unit if you know you're not going to get your deposit back anyway, even if you leave it in pristine conditions. So I understand it would be pushed through, but I just, I think we need some better understanding of what the deposit is for versus what are these costs of doing business? And you're right, we should work with Mercy Housing on figuring out how they, sh they deserve clean apartments as well. Great, thank you. Um, Madam Chair, or Senator Cooter, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, so Ryan, um, I was, your comment about um, always cleaning the carpet and following up on what Senator Shoemake was asking about, um, that wasn't always the case, at least I know, um, you know, back in the day when I was a renter, that was not considered a, a charge or a pass through. And rent was set based off of area median income. You don't have a cost plus profit model, at least we don't here, and we didn't where, I, where I'm originally from. So I'm curious when that changed. You know, when did it change that these costs were passed through to the, the tenant or charged to the tenant? Because clearly at some point in time, um, it shifted. Um, Madam Chair, virtual chair, um, um, that's a little awkward. Um, I, I don't know. I've only been back in the state for a few years, so I couldn't speak to that specifically. I could tell you I grew up in Washington, and the first rental unit I had was, I believe, 19... 95 in college and my cleaning deposit was taken out of my deposit back then. Um, since then, subsequently, including my current unit, I have actually um, I have actually paid an upfront fee that was non-refundable. So I am not sure if that's, that was a legal change or a business practice change. So I can't, and I, I, I was gone for 20 years. I can't speak to any change in the market or if there was a legal change around that. But I know I have paid for that almost every location I've been in, including Oregon for the last five years. 
Thank you so much. All right, let's move on to our next testifiers, Gordon Haggerty. You are up. Go ahead. Hello. Um, my name is Gordon Haggerty, and I've been a small landlord uh, for in the Seattle area for over 50 years now. And I'm testifying today in opposition to SHB 1074, although um, uh, it's much better now than it was when it started out. So um, I'm more in favor now than I was before. Uh, I thank you for your time today. Um, we work hard to be able to give full refunds to our tenants when they move out. And we do our best to communicate our expectations as well as our mutual responsibilities, both at move in during the tenancy and at move out by providing clear checklists and instructions for cleaning during and at the end of their tenancy, because we none of us want surprises. Uh, we also stress that making repairs to accidental damages is easier to do during the tenancy. And it's also cheaper to take care of damage repairs in the course of regular uh, maintenance processes and things than it is when we're trying to turn over uh, in a short time between tenants. And so uh, we do the most, uh, we do most all of our work uh, in-house so we're able to discount our labor charges below what we need to charge at turnover uh, because we can do it with our regular maintenance schedules. And so uh, the tenant benefits from that too, to be proactive on that. Um, and when we do that, the tenant, I just want to stress, the tenant is only charged for damages that they cause and not for routine maintenance. Uh, this is a win-win for everyone, and it encourages uh, tenants to notify us of accidental damages when they do happen and get them fixed so that their unit is in good condition rather than waiting for us to discover the damages after they move out. As a result, um, and I say my time is out, but uh, as a result, we rarely have to deduct charges from security deposits, and when we do, we document our time and materials very carefully. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Haggerty. I was just going to ask you the exact question you answered there after the two-minute mark, so good work, uh, about whether or not you took it out of the deposit. Um, I do have a question for you just as a matter of practice, and this is curiosity. Um, you mentioned really encouraging tenants to notify you when there's accidental damage sort of in real time. Is that part right. of your rental agreement or part of the terms of getting the deposit back that they notify you of um, a hole in the wall or a leak or something like that so that you can repair it in a timely fashion? Is that part of your practice? Yes, we do that. That's part of our uh, uh, rules and procedures uh, uh, that is part of our agreement. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. That's just good clarity. All right. Any other yeah. questions? No. All right. Bruce Becker, you are up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bruce Becker, and I am a small mom and pop and the pop of a landlord in Seattle. And uh, I'll answer um, your question that you just asked Warden, uh, which was a good one, and that is um, when my tenants move in, I tell them uh, that uh, my, my main concerns are that they pay the rent and the utilities uh, on a timely basis and that uh, they take good care of the house. And if something goes wrong, I want to know. Certainly if there's a, if there's a, a, a leak or a, a roof leak or something, most recently it was a, a fence post that was uh, in need of repair. And uh, the, the tenants uh, uh, contacted me and uh, I was able to take care of it promptly. The, um, and and I, that's the, uh, I think that's the typical thing. My, I've got a couple of concerns. I'll, I'll uh, first address the issue of carpet cleaning. And it, it really, uh, I'm concerned about the fact that, there, that the, this bill is providing for no carpet cleaning fee if, uh, if the carpet's worn. It has nothing to do with whether the carpet's worn. It has to do with whether it's dirty. If, you, if it was clean when uh, people moved in, it should be clean uh, when they move out. And uh, the people who occupy the unit should be paying for that uh, on, on one end or the other. I'm also really concerned about the de redefinition of, uh, of uh, normal wear and tear. Normal wear and tear has been the standard for many years. And now we're changing it to ordinary use. And I think this is a very confusing issue because um, I think ordinary use is something beyond normal wear and tear. And it's going to mean uh, more, uh, more disputes rather than fewer 
uh, about what uh, what is considered uh, ordinary use compared to normal wear and tear. Um, and I'm also concerned about the fact that uh, 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 severe damage may not be able to be documented within 30 days. I think contacting someone within the 21 or 30 day uh, timeline is sufficient for notifying people that there's a problem with getting the damage deposit back, but it may take uh, much longer, weeks longer, if there's significant damage to a unit. So I'm opposed uh, to this bill at this Thank time. You. Thank you, Mr. Becker. Um, I do want to ask staff one clarifying question, kind of based on something that Mr. Becker just said about um, it's going to change the definition and it's going to make it's beyond normal wear and tear. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there is no, was there no statutory definition of wear and tear, correct? That is correct. So by adding a definition of ordinary use, we are defining in statute what we, what we think is, what may otherwise been uh, understood as normal wear and tear. We are calling it ordinary use and actually putting a definition and that's what's in this bill, correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. I feel like we just lost somebody. Okay. Um, before we have the next folks come up, um, on deck will be in Zoom Lawrence Kreitz, Corey Slautog, and Deborah Bermudez. Um, but let's go back to our panel. Michelle Thomas uh, in person, come to the front. Nick Federici online, and Hunter Herrera McFarland. Michelle, go ahead and get started. Hi, I'm Michelle Thomas with the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance Pro on House Bill 1074. First, I want to address something that the uh, previous testifier said. Just to be really clear, there is no law that currently prohibits non-refundable fees, nor does this bill prohibit non-refundable fees. Just be very clear about that. Um, what this bill does do is address a longstanding problem with inflated and uns unsubstantiated damage claims, as you have heard. This is really important for basic fairness, but also because unpaid debt to a landlord can damage a tenant's credit and screening reports for years, which deeply impacts housing opportunities and also increases the cost of moving with repeated tenant screening fees and higher damage deposits at move-in. If a tenant has caused damages beyond normal wear and tear, they can and should be charged but those damages should be substantiated and the tenant should only be paying for the real cost of the repairs. Additionally, I want you to consider the impact that these unsubstantiated claims have on our state's homelessness recovery efforts. When a tenant has a claim against, against them on their record, as I said, it creates a significant barrier to housing. And of course, it's unacceptable to leave that person stuck in homelessness because they can't secure housing. So homeless resources are sometimes used to pay off damage claims that are blocking housing opportunity, which is extremely helpful. But inflated or unsubstantiated claims waste our homeless dollars that are already stretched too thin. So this bill protects tenants and it really does protect our state's homelessness resources. So thank you so much for the opportunity to testify and please vote yes. Thank you, Michelle, so much for your testimony. Um, I was just informed my staff that neither Lawrence Kreitz nor Corey Slotberg um, are Slothaug are online. So just a heads up to Sarah Nagy in the room to be on deck, Kent Hendricks and Carrie Stan Berry after our current panel. Thank you so much. All right, I don't see any questions. Uh, Nick Federici, you're next, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Acting Chair, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Nick Federici representing the city of Spokane on this legislation in strong support of this legislation. Um, city of Spokane believes it's important to balance rights and responsibilities between parties um, and that this bill is a small but important step to do that by protecting tenants and help with the affordability for rental housing for those tenants, particularly in the current affordable housing crisis where every dollar counts for tenants um, and where um, income stability and and the, the uh, a foreknowledge of what uh, of what they're going to have to pay um, is clear. We believe this bill is, is quite straightforward and simple, promoting accountability and transparency. Literally, show your receipts, as the saying goes. Um, if property owners want to withhold tenant deposits, there should be an obligation to document the actual damage and cost due to that individual tenant um, beyond uh, the normal wear and tear. Um, it may be an insignificant cost uh, of a couple hundred dollars to somebody with a business, um, to building owners, but it is a lot of money to particularly low income tenants um, who depend on a clean rental history and, um, and, uh, and, and no incidents against them to be able to, uh, to, be able to get additional rental housing as you've, as you've heard, particularly in this uh, era of, again, 
severe housing affordability crisis with escalating numbers and size of deposits and fees being charged to tenants. Um, we believe this, uh, this uh, small but important piece of legislation uh, should pass the legislature and urge your support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, seeing no questions, let's keep going. Hunter Herrera McFarland, go ahead. Hey everyone, I am a uh, employee at an affordable housing developer and an advocacy organization called the Kelsey. I am also on the board of the Washington State Tenants Union, uh, but most importantly, I am a renter in Bellingham. Uh, this bill is a, really a lifeline for a significant amount of renters who live paycheck to paycheck and rely on their deposit money to pay the rising cost of utilities and other necessities. I, for example, deep cleaned my single family home and it took me roughly 20 hours to complete because I also had to do yard care. I hired a carpet cleaner. I even fixed nail holes in my wall. I did everything correct. Um, and my landlord even admitted to having to rush the cleaning of the unit before I moved in because the previous tenant was very messy. And despite this, my landlord told me that a cleaning crew had to spend 11 hours cleaning the unit after I vacated. And the invoice he sent me didn't have the name of the company on it. And when I requested the name, he told me he would not provide it to me. Uh, and he, this is uh, okay because it's not required by law to provide me verifiable documentation. And this piece of legislation would change that. Um, he also claimed that I didn't give him 60 days notice and that uh, that I was vacating. Um, and so he could keep my deposit for this reason as well, even though he converted me to a month to month lease. So 30 days was the only thing that I was legally required to give him. Um, he also charged me for keys that I mailed to him because he wasn't available to do a walkthrough on the days that I requested. Um, and so I had no evidence the keys were returned. Um, I also decided that, uh, you know, it wasn't worth to fight with him in court. Um, and even though I took extensive photos and videos of the unit with the newspaper in the frame, um, and I was given a checklist at move in, but nothing with potential costs of repairs associated with it. Um, unfortunately, my anecdotal story is entirely the norm. The power is with the landlords and not the tenants in these scenarios because the law is extremely vague. It's more important than ever that we stand by renters and pass meaningful solutions that will help them live healthy and happy lives. And so I urge you to vote yes on this piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hunter. We do have a question, but before I even go to that, can you identify yourself for the record, please? Yeah, sorry. My name's Hunter Herrera McFarland. Thank you. All right, Senator Shumate, go ahead with your question. Hi, Hunter. I also live in Bellingham, and I'm just wondering if we have the same landlord. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah, he is a small uh, landlord who uh, goes, you know, by Eagle Property Manager, um, and he actually told me that he wasn't the owner of the unit, but then I found out later he was. Uh, so he was masquerading as just a property manager when he was actually the owner. That's disappointing. Okay. Uh, Senator Cooter, Madam Virtual Chair, whoever gave you that title earlier, I like that. Madam Virtual Chair, go ahead. Yeah, I'll take it. Um, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. So my question for this panel is, um, are there, isn't there any guidelines, especially from tenant, the tenants union, to tenants to like film the unit before they move out or to take photos? Um, my daughter in Denver had a, you know, um, she was moving out. I told her to take photos of everything, including the inside of the refrigerator, all of that. She did get a bill uh, for damages. And when she told them that she had photographs, they said they made a mistake and she didn't have to pay anything extra. So I'm just wondering, I mean, Nick and, and Michelle and Hunter, I mean, isn't there an ability here to document yourself uh, what the unit looks like when, when you leave. Michelle, you're welcome to come up if you'd like to re respond to Chair Cooter's question. But And Nick, if you're still there. So the question was to any of you or none of you. <laughs> Michelle, do you want to go ahead? Sure. And just to understand the question is like, so what, what what's available to a tenant um, as they attempt to document the unit at after at the point at, when they vacate? Yeah, wouldn't it be like best practices to simply tell tenants to to video the unit before they vacate? Yeah, I think a lot of tenants do. The question is, though, um, I don't think that solves the problem because the landlord, even if they claim there's a damage, which the tenant may or may not have been able to um, take a picture of or have any proof of, they don't know what the cost of repairing that damage was. And that's really one of the biggest pieces that this legislation um, uh, addresses. Plus, 
whether or not that damage was caused by the tenant is also critically important. So the documentation of the quality of the unit at move-in is also really critical. So you need both pieces. And a lot of times when tenants sign that move-in um, checklist, if they're lucky enough to do that with their landlord, and if their landlord does sign it, tenants oftentimes don't even get a copy of that. So you don't have a copy, especially if you've lived there a long time and management has turnover. You know, you can't necessarily prove what the what was in the unit at move-in and what how that's different at the time of move out. And Nick or Hunter, anything to add? Okay, if not, but... The only thing I would add is that right now, I think that landlords and tenants are in a game of he said, she said, right? And that the way this this uh, legislation would put things into place, it would establish a set of rules around that. That And yeah, it would be, it would be wise uh, for, you know, when I rent a car, I take a video of the outside of the car and document that um, before, I, uh, before I drive out of the rental car lot. This is obviously something that is a significantly greater uh, 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 financial impact on uh, on renters for a for significantly longer time. So it, it, it would be wise for them to do so. This bill would put in place some rules around um, what should be documented and by whom and how um, so that it's no longer a finger pointing exercise, but becomes something that is based on documentation. Right now, as, as uh, I believe that um, that Hunter said, right now the power is all in the hands of the landlord um, and they can veto any protestations by putting rules in place that guide this relationship for, for damage deposits. Um, it would change that, uh, that balance of power and again, um, you know, show receipts and, and, show, uh, and show pictures um, so that the reality is known. Thanks but so again, much. it's not just documenting whether there was a problem, it's the cost of repairing that. So what did the landlord actually pay? And is that can the landlord substantiate that? And should should the tenant be charged anything in excess of that? Senator Gildon has a question. Go ahead. Thank you. And I think that, that kind of outlines one of the difficulties because, as we've heard, it takes many times much longer to get the work done and then to get the receipt than the 30 days allotted. But we also want to get the, the deposits back to the tenants as quickly as possible so that they can you know, move into their next place. So um, that's what I'm struggling with is how do you reconcile the, those two issues with, you know, the length of time it takes to get repairs done and to get the receipts and provide them with the tenants and then but still trying to get the deposits back to the tenants quickly. I think it's important to recognize um, that this bill actually gives landlords more time than under current law. Right, it extends it. So I think that that's something that would help address that problem. So this bill, and in in, to your question and your point, could be beneficial. Uh, Senator Saldana has a question. Go ahead. And I mean, it could be for all. I mean, I think it's just a general uh, for us to be thinking about. Is um, why? I mean, is it not just is it not happening on a regular basis where there's an actual walk-in or picture and and a, and a return back you know documentation? Because I think. That could be written like these are the things that we saw were the the needs that needed to be fixed. Here, you know, we're going to pay someone to do this at this rate, um, and that is going to be a more or less the deduction. And if that's a, a written agreement that both of them sign, like that, why 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 can't something like that already happen or be like that? What we put into statute a certain process that a tenant can expect would would be followed and so that they can have some clarity to know I have maybe 750 to be able to get ready to go to the next place um, and you know know that it might take longer for them to repair you know I was a landlord you know I mean I it just yeah I was a landlord but of someone I know right and I did the repairs I you know had you know looked at fair market value for my hours and you know, charge that and deducted, right? Or you know, so I think those are the things where, it, obviously, you, know, you have large companies out there that should be able to manage, you know, having a proper, someone walk with them. Um, you know, we're, we just hear, of course, a lot of cases that really are are heartbreaking, and you know, trying to figure out how do we have something that's reasonable to help provide guidance and, and limit those heartbreaking stories. I think don't you agree is usually the way that you end a statement like that. <laughs> I agree. It's heartbreaking. <laughs> 
All right. Um, I do see we have a question from Senator Trudeau online. Senator Trudeau, would you like to turn on your camera, unmute yourself, and ask your question? I'm a, yes, I'm a little bit nervous to turn on my camera, and I hope that my committee members won't judge me. Um, I don't have COVID, but my nanny does, so. We will not judge you. Hopefully. <laughs> Madam <laughs> Senator you. Trudeau, this is real life Washington State. This <laughs> is been in the legislature. Go it ahead, sure Senator. is. I, no, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, well, the testimony so far has reminded me of two certain scenarios. And so the question at the outset is um, how this bill would apply to these two scenarios. So I'm curious, anybody can answer that that's already testified or if maybe Sarah's coming up in a minute, something that she said prompted it. But one was a situation where um, an individual um, was renting and had a paid a larger deposit because they they were told that they needed a larger deposit than the standard deposit because of maybe some things um, in their past or or whatever. Paid a larger deposit, did a walkthrough at the end, was told that uh, without any itemized idea or um, details in terms of what they were going to be charging them, was told, okay, well, all of the things that I ran through uh, maximizes your deposit. You're not going to get a deposit bought back. And then that individual um, said, well, my total deposit is actually more than that and was told, well, then we're going to have to recalculate this and we may have to do a second walkthrough without you because we didn't realize that you had paid more of a deposit than our standard deposit. So it was clear that that person was using a baseline. And this was someone that I, that I had um, helped out personally. And then the second scenario I was thinking of was where... Um, there's an individual, oh great, my four-year-old just walked in. This could get a lot harder for me to ask the question. Uh, uh, well, the second was an individual that was told by a large property management company that they were, they're a limited English speaker. Okay, I'll get you a yogurt milk piece. Um, was told by, uh, <laughs> thank you everyone so much, was told by uh, their landlord, um, we're not gonna give you the deposit back because you had asked for a few things to be fixed while you were there, like broken blinds, like putting screens on the windows um, of, the, of the child that had certain needs and so couldn't have windows without screens on them. And then when I called as a sophi more sophisticated actor, they were like, well, actually, maybe we wanna reassess. So I'm just curious how this bill would speak to those two situations so that I can understand, because those are two concrete examples where I saw uh, that the narrative changed depending on who was asking the question, sort of what the power dynamic was in that situation and whether they had all the, um, yeah, I guess I would just stop there. So I, I'd love to know how this bill applies to them. And um, that is my question. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. So, and Sarah um, could come up. I mean, you're going to be on deck anyway. So Sarah, if you want to um, come up and answer that question. Um, by the way, we always welcome questions from Senator Rumi. Um, thank you. Senator Trudeau for having Rumi join us. Um, Michelle or Sarah or Nick or Hunter, anybody on the panel that want to try to answer that question? Yeah, sure thing. Hi. I'm Mind I identifying yourself for the record? Yes. Hello again. I'm Sarah Nagy, it's Columbia Legal Services. Um, Senator Trudeau, I think the most important thing with both of those situations is that actual costs are the same. They don't change depending on who's asking. The amount it actually cost doesn't, it doesn't matter who asked. And the documentation of those costs is the same regardless of who's asking under this bill. So that prevents those situations that you described where it may be that someone unscrupulous is with full intention taking advantage of someone who they guess isn't going to be able to contest it or isn't going to know how. So, Great. Thank you so much. I don't see anybody else attempting to answer that question. So thank you to all of our panelists. Sarah, you can just stay right there. Um, my understanding is the panel we had on deck, Lawrence Kreitz, Corey Slothaug, and Deborah um, Bermudez, none of which are in Zoom right now. So we'll go ahead and move on to Sarah Nagy in the room and then online to Kent Hendricks. And we'll wrap up with Carrie Stanberry if Carrie um, appears in Zoom. Sarah, go ahead with your testimony. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, again, my name is Sarah Nagy with Columbia Legal Services, and uh, we are here asking that you pass House Bill 1074. 
Um, I do want to use my time to respond to a couple of questions and comments from other points of testimony. Um, first, I want to return to a mention of the case of Silver versus Redeen Management. That's a 2021 case. Um, I believe the intent may have been to refer to Goodall v. Madison Real Estate, which is a 2015 case, and that one addresses the issue of um, final charges uh, d deposits not being able to be deducted for estimates needing to be deducted for final charges. Silver versus Rudine is a 2021 case that has to do with the statute of limitations for a tenant suing for the return of their damaged deposit. So very different. And um, Goodall has been law again since 2015. Um, it's been in practice and a requirement since then. And there's nothing in the current law or in this bill that conflicts with it. Um, I also want to uh, clarify the bill's provision on carpet cleaning. It states that carpet cleaning uh, can't be charged for unless the carpet is damaged in excess of ordinary wear and tear. I want to make clear that that is making current law explicit, as Michelle said. Um, if there is a regular carpet cleaning fee that is paid between tenancies, regardless of condition, then the landlord is free to charge that as a fee, as long as it is correctly documented in the lease. Um, and I want to reiterate as well that, um, as I said earlier, the landlord has protection from liability if they can show, if, if it comes to a dispute, if they can show that they were prevented from making that 21-day, that 30-day time limit by circumstances beyond their control. And the ravages of an extremely messed up supply chain that makes it impossible to get work done no matter how quickly you're on it, how promptly you get there, that's something the landlord is protected from in current law and in the bill. Um, I see I'm out of time. Um, if there's any questions or if any questions from earlier that I can answer, I'm happy to. Great. Let's go ahead and let uh, Kent Hendricks testify, and then we'll come back. I know I have one question for you, Sarah, so stay put. Um, but Kent Hendricks, why don't you, you've been so patient waiting in Zoom for quite some time, so go ahead with your testimony. Thank you. My name is Kent Hendricks. For 15 years, my wife and I have been providing housing in Snohomish County, now for 17 individuals and families. When I first meet prospective tenants, I tell them I have four requirements. Pay the rent on time, take good care of the place, be a good neighbor, and communicate with me if something goes wrong so we can work it out. And I think I'm a typical landlord in that respect. In my view, parts of this bill don't change current law in any substantial way, yet it may restate the ordinary wear and tear standards more clearly, which is good. However, it is inconsistent and deviates from its wear and tear message when it adds that a tenant is no longer responsible for the cost of cleaning carpets. Cleaning and wear and tear are completely different items. Tenants are and should be responsible for cleaning. They clean the stove, the bathroom, the walls, the vinyl floor. So why shouldn't they be responsible for cleaning the carpet? The carpet was professionally cleaned when they moved in. And so why wouldn't the next tenant also expect it to be clean? I just wonder if somebody's going to propose a bill next year that doesn't require tenants to clean anything. So bills like this, in my view, just increase the cost of providing housing. And they make hardworking housing providers like us want to get out of the business. So I make clear to every tenant that I want to give them a full refund of their deposit when they move out, less the carpet cost of carpet cleaning, which is in accordance with our lease. Now, I'm sure there are Unfortunately, a small number of dishonest landlords out there, and I'm sorry that they've created a bad name for, for the vast majority of us. But contrary to what has been pre previously presented, we never charge for cleaning that isn't needed, nor for any actual damages not caused by the tenant. And we also know that a few irresponsible tenants leave the apartment in much worse condition than we can fix with just their deposit. But to institute a, a short one-year limitation to collect on those extra costs due to their disrespectful decisions isn't fair to those of us who provide a nice place for people to live. So although it's not intended, this bill just feels like another effort to kill by a thousand cuts those of us who work so hard to provide housing to the good people of this state. So I urge you to, to oppose it. Thank Thanks. you so much for your testimony, Mr. Hendricks. Uh, we do have a question. Senator Shoemake. Um, thank you, Mr. Hendricks. So my mom rented out units, and one of my core memories is spending time at Home Depot looking for her for repairing things or smelling paint while she fixed things up. Um, but I've also rented, and it's not just a few landlords that are unscrupulous. It's enough that it 
um, messes up the system for you too. Because if I feel like it's a crapshoot whether or not I get a deposit back and it is not related to the condition of my unit, then why do I even bother? I mean, it's just, it's so frustrating. And it, you don't know that until after you've moved out and you've, you finished that relationship with the landlord. Um, I was telling, um, we were talking earlier and I mean, once I got charged $50 because there was a piece of clothing behind the dryer, I mean, that was just, it was ridiculous. Um, so I guess I'd like to know, like as a landlord, like how, you're better off when your other, the other people in your roles also behave ethically. And it's really hard to legislate ethical behavior sometimes. So I wonder if you have ideas on how we can make this so it, it does better protect you and it does foster that relationship where tenants can trust you because they also, once that relationship is over, they just don't have any power. And so there's no recourse. The landlord holds all the power in that piece. And we're just asking for some accountability. So if you have better ways to make this work for someone like you, it's definitely not trying to punish the good landlords that I know are out there, but just that accountability piece. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, the accountability is the documentation. We we document clearly the state of the unit when they move in. We walk through it together. We go through a very detailed checklist identifying you know, the condition of the entryway, the, the doorknobs, the, the hinges. We, we look at everything. We document it together. We agree to the condition that it's in. And then when they move out, we go through the same process, exactly the same sheet. We make a checkoff. We both sign it. And, and we identify those things that need some work. And I will give them an estimate at that point what needs to be done. It, the law is in place um, and, I, and I follow it and it works really well. And I keep in touch with my tenants regularly. I'm there every week, you know, cleaning things around the yard or whatever it might be. They, they know me, I know them, we care about each other. It's, it's, it's legislation that turns us against each other that is so frustrating for me. I feel like every time the legislature goes in session, I've got to gear up for battle again because they're trying to make my life difficult and trying to turn me and my tenants against each other, which is not the current case. We work together. We provide something that we both need and want. And, and we are very clear in writing about our relationship in every way. Um, Mr. Hendricks, thanks for your testimony today. And I'll just say, temporary chair's privilege, it sounds like you'll have no problem complying with this legislation because you're doing all the right things. So thank I, you I, for that. Appreciate, I would really, honestly, we, we appreciate you and wish there were more landlords out there acting exactly as it sounds like you are with your tenants. So thank you for your time today. All right, any other questions? Um, my understanding from the team is that everybody else um, that we had signed in to testify is not appearing in Zoom at this point. Um, so with that, unless we have any other questions, virtual or otherwise, I think we are done with our hearing for Substitute House Bill 1074. Um, and with that, we're adjourned. Mr. Winky, member, you want to do the honors? You want to gavel us out? We Thank are adjourned. Woo. Thanks, everybody.